Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Welcome to this Jungian Life and our topic for today, which is conspiracy theories. I wonder if it has seemed to you, as I think it seems to many of us, that we are living in kind of a post-fact world. And there are many, many stories, all kinds of activation in the collective about all kinds of things. This substrate that we're going to try to delve into is uh, a lot, to my mind, like the Gulf Stream. It's really there. It's really powerful. But it's very hard to see where it begins and ends. There are no mile markers. So I hope we're going to go on a ride down this Gulf Stream and see if we can differentiate it from uh, the context in which it's operating. Where does it come from? Where does it go? And what are the psychological components of some of the stories that are afoot? Deb, I love that image of the Gulf Stream. It's perfect because... Uh, conspiracy theories are in the same water as all the other information mm -hmm. in the culture. I mean, and, and it has a different temperature. It moves secretly in a different direction. It attracts uh, different denizens that like to live in the warmer water. <laughs> and from the outside, it's invisible. You can't tell standing on the shore where the Gulf Stream is necessarily, but it has a huge impact also on the entire weather and the ecosystem of an area. Yeah. So I think that's just a gorgeous, really apt metaphor. And the other reason it's a great apt metaphor is that the boundaries between the Gulf Stream water and the colder water next to it, it's mm. not crystal clear, right? right? I mean, I'm appreciating that there are occasionally things that sound like absolutely crazy conspiracy theories that wind up being true. And I'm thinking as one example of MK Ultra which was a secret mind control program that was um, uh, under the aegis of the CIA, and it was denied for years. And then there was a Freedom of Information Act request. And, you know, with what the initial people who were speaking out about it said, it was all substantiated. So that, that does happen. But, you know, I'm thinking that back to the Gulf Stream analogy, isn't it hard to differentiate uh, between something that is compartmentalized, that is a department of government or any other organization uh, that's not for public knowledge and a full-fledged conspiracy. That's where I think some of the boundaries get fluid because we do have compartmentalizations uh, in our society. I'm thinking about the, the stories that uh, get into the popular culture that that are unmistakably uh, part of this uh, symbolic Gulf Stream that we're we're talking about today, of uh, really mainstream things about 
uh, rulers and Area 51, the Roswell thing, uh, cell wait, tower. Wait, 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 wait. You're not saying that Area 51 is a conspiracy, are you? <laughs> <laughs> As a, a secret alien somewhere in the desert of New Mexico, um, moon landings, JFK's assassination, vaccinations being harmful. There, There are a lot of things now there may be listeners out there that are saying, wait a minute, you know, but that's what, what I think is true. So there again is this dif- difficulty with discernment of what is one person's conspiracy theory, maybe somebody else's real conviction. Absolutely. And it has to do with the attitude with which we meet these extraordinary ideas and whether or not we come into union with it or whether we hold it at a distance as something that's funny or even dangerous. I was happy to find out that uh, the etymology of the word uh, conspiracy is the conspiratio, <laughs> which, which then makes it sound like an alchemical. Whoa. Yes, <laughs> the conspiratio, uh, which uh, basically means agreement or union or uh, unanimity. So we're in a conspiratio anytime we come, we decide we're going to be in union with an idea and union with a people standing against the despotic aliens in area 51 or any number of other things. But there is something seductive about being drawn into a collective, which what it gives us perhaps a sense of identity. Maybe if we've not had a clear sense of identity and other things. Or a a sense of specialness and being the possessor of special secret knowledge. And I I love that uh, what you did with the etymology there, because there is a sense that a conspiracy theory is something that you join with others in believing. Mm -hmm. And I I think that's one of the reasons that the internet can really fuel conspiracy theories, Mm -hmm. because it used to be if you had some uh, kind of non-mainstream belief, let's say, you might be the only one who had that belief and it couldn't be kind of reinforced and fed and watered by a group. But on the internet, you can go find other people who have share that same mm-hmm. non-mainstream belief and, and then a pocket can get created. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about the creation of communities, creating a sense of belonging and uh, we might even call it tribalism that these are my my fellow tribal members all across the country or even the world, thanks to social media and the internet, that I can find a community of people like me that I feel I belong. I think that even just putting it into a Jungian frame, I think we're also talking about what you brought up, Joseph, and I'll kind of pass the baton to you, which is participation mystique. Jung was very, very interested in this, and he borrowed the term from an anthropologist named Levi Bruhl, and he was examining ancient cultures, of course, and he was trying to theorize how an ancient community could believe something which to the modern psyche would seem extraordinary or maybe even outlandish. And as Jung took that on, and he observed that even in modern European culture, he imagined that the ego, the normal state of consciousness, could, under duress or through lack of self-development, sink lower into the collective unconscious than was good for it, and then become deeply entrapped or seduced into a sense of groupthink or collective beliefs that are not adequately examined or perhaps not even really helpful for the development of the individual. He found that participation mystique was a real um, concern for him, and it also was natural. He also thought that falling desperately in love with somebody at first sight Mm -hmm. was also a participation mystique. Yes. So it's, it's kind of a regression in a way. It's a lowering of the threshold of consciousness. And there's a way that when we join with others in passionately embracing a non-mainstream belief, we may be in a state of participation mystique. It also brings up this idea 
that that uh, Deb, you raised earlier as well of projection. Mm. And I have a feeling we're going to be returning again and again to the idea of projection throughout this episode, because I think that's yes. often what's really going on is that elements of the unconscious, unmediated archetypes, p- bits of our personal shadow get projected out there into the collective, particularly in places where uh, there may be something that is unknown. There's some kind of lacuna of information around something. And the unconscious just sort of naturally patches that over with a projection that restores a sense of integrity and creates this kind of unified web of meaning. And in that way, conspiracy theories are like little mythologems. Mm -hmm. And I think further that if I suspect that when we examine conspiracy theories, we're going to find an archetype at the heart of them all. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like they're little modern mythologies that get created. Well, I'm thinking about uh, in projection that there is automatically a polarization of that uh, it's an either or essentially construct of one part is set up against another part of access to sort of secret knowledge and that there is an other out there or others or forces or something that need to be opposed. I I think you're right on it, Deb, because there's a difference between creating a a religious or mythic explanation for something, which, by Mm -hmm. the way, could be benign, versus conspiracy theories, which often tend to characterize something as evil or malevolent and that we have to position against it. And just as a a fun example of the two, scientists really didn't understand combustion. And so they just decided that there must be a chemical substance called phlogestin, phlogestin, (laughs) which which was omnipresent in all kinds of combustible objects that somehow (laughs) triggered thing's ability to catch on fire. I think I get that after I eat like spicy food. <laughs> right. And then of course science goes in and says, well, there really is nothing. Phlogiston is really not real, but it was a, a modern mythology to explain a phenomena. But also I don't think they believed phlogiston was like out to get them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think we're in this specialized carrier uh, area of mythology where we're talking about evil. Mm-hmm. And that there is something evil out there which we have to know about and then create a response to, even if it is, if it is a myth. Well, I don't, I don't know. Evil. I, I get what you're saying. Evil might be a bit of an overstatement. I'm thinking about people that say like the lunar landing was uh, falsified, and I, I don't know that that would be evil, but it's certainly something that needs to be ta- that you have to take a stand against. Mm. I, I think so. I just want to um, go at this from just a slightly different way for a minute, which is I, one of the things I really appreciate about Jung, and we've talked about this in previous podcasts, is he was such a phenomenologist that he would hear the most outlandish things and not immediately dismiss anything. He was he was just interested in hearing what there was to hear and then orienting to it in this careful way where he neither landed on it immediately or dismissed it immediately. And um, I I find that that's a really helpful way to orient to all kinds of phenomenon. When I was 15, I got to visit the Soviet Union, which uh, at that point was kind of unusual. And uh, it was was a, a school trip. And we were given access to um, school kids around our age that had been sort of carefully handpicked by the KGB for us to meet. And, you know, we kind of got these dog and pony shows and were these very impressive schools in Moscow. And then we got to talk to the students who, of course, all spoke beautiful English. And I remember talking to some kids and they said to me, and this would have been in well, I'm not going to say the year, but it was substantially <laughs> after. 1870 what? <laughs> Stop it, Deb. It was substantially after the end of Viet- the Vietnam War. Okay. And this one kid said to me, why do you still have soldiers in Vietnam? And I said, what? We don't still have soldiers in Vietnam. He said, yes, you do. Your government is lying to you. Mm. Now, I mean, I was sophisticated enough to understand that the United States has a free press 
and that it would be extraordinarily difficult to hide something like there were still U.S. troops stationed in Vietnam to understand that that was not true of the Soviet Union. But it did lead me into a bit of a thought experiment that, that I think changed me, which is how do I really know who's telling the truth here? And again, you know, it was it was like a thought experiment because at the at the end of the day, I I knew that we didn't really have troops in Vietnam, but but it was really interesting because I thought, how would I know? How would I know if my government were lying to me? Would I really know? Uh, this person, this young young person that I'm speaking with, is a hundred percent sure that my government is lying to me, and I'm a hundred percent sure that his government is lying to him. So how do you know? And I think that there is a way that when I hear a crazy conspiracy theory, I still sort of say, well, how do I know that's not true? Could there be something there? So I, I feel a little bit like I've uh, got a, a bit of Jung's phenomenological approach of like, well, let's let's listen and see. And it brings up the kind of subjectivity of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And you know what Jung would say about that is there is no real way of knowing for sure. And that this is part of the work of individuation and discernment and sifting through things using your thinking function, using your feeling function, and engaging with it as best you can to determine your own sense of truth, you know, taking into account uh, objective knowledge, but realizing that there are limits to objective knowledge. I cannot personally ascertain through the input of my own five senses that we indeed landed on the moon. <laughs> so there, there are limits of my ability to verify that, you know, with my own, you know, hands and eyes and ears and that sort of thing. So to a certain extent, I have to depend on authority. We do have to depend on authority, but I still want to make this distinction between um, misinformation, mythology, and conspiracy. So my question would be to somebody who says the moon landing didn't happen, would be what is the nefarious intention behind these government figures who are trying to convince you that they landed on the moon and they didn't? Because so, I think that in the realm of conspiracy theory, we're talking about something that is more dangerous than just misinformation or the misrepresentation of facts. So Joseph, I just are you saying that this belief that the moon landing didn't happen, you would not consider that a conspiracy theory, is that correct? Well, my question would be because I think that in and of itself is is an accusation of misinformation or misleading the public. My question to that person would be and what is the negative effect that you believe that is happening on people? What what is the nefarious government trying to achieve by staging this moon landing such that you're highly alarmed or feel in danger by the fact that maybe this was staged and wasn't real? That's where I would be pushing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're, you're reaching into this thing that I also think comes with conspiracy theories, and that is a modicum of paranoia. Yes. Right. And the feeling that the social order is somehow collapsing, uh, that we can't uh, trust uh, what authorities tell us, you know, which kind of takes me into the parental complexes uh, that uh, we have leaders, we have uh, institutions, we have government. And what happens when we can't trust those sort of symbolic, overarching, uh, parental, if you will, uh, functions and values that uh, our government would uh, engage in this gigantic hoax uh, that we landed on the moon, but we didn't. Which, by the way, takes me back to the objective stance, which is how many people would it take to keep that kind of a secret. It would take thousands and thousands of people to keep that kind of a secret uh, that we landed on the moon when, in fact, we didn't. And I'm thinking about, uh, I don't know, uh, my kids and the time that I was a teenager, which was back in the 18th century, by the way, that nobody could keep a secret about a surprise party. So there is an objective tool of, uh, does this really make sense? Yeah, there's a kind of common sense element. Yeah. <laughs> there is such a thing as kind of fact checking and uh, 
you know, access to a rational construct of what is the likelihood that something of this magnitude could really be faked. But I do think underneath it all is a kind of distrust uh, of uh, authorities and uh, perhaps a kind of um, fraying of a sense of social cohesion. And I think in that tremendous experience of anxiety that those things Mm -hmm. produce, Deb, that conspiracy theories often give people a sense of meaning and security and control over a very unpredictable and dangerous world in general. Mm -hmm. And yet it doesn't have any real efficacy because how they're orienting to the danger of the world through the mythology of the conspiracy theory only abates a little bit of anxiety, but doesn't actually make them any safer. So that really bizarre, tragic story about Pizzagate and this strange child abuse ring that's running in a basement of a pizza parlor. That doesn't even have a basement. That doesn't even have a basement, even if it did have a basement. Giving people this sense of false clarity that that's the nexus of evil And then this schmo that shows up with a rifle, you know, to try to rescue the children in the basement of the pizza parlor, who then is arrested and prosecuted for it. The sense that it's such a simple explanation that if I just go to the pizza parlor and I just take down these nefarious pizza people, then all of a sudden this great evil will be resolved in the world and then we'll all be safer and and that kind of childlike way of thinking that that's going to solve something that is so complicated and distressing and horrifying as the mistreatment of children or the abuse of children is is a false sense of security it's a false solution well it it is about i think a need for certainty even false certainty. Yes. And and Jung, Jung talked about that. You know, I mean, that's an inability to hold the tension of the opposites. That life is infinitely complex. That we as humans are infinitely complex. And there's no one story that encompasses everything. I think I am going back on some of these uh, conspiracy theories, especially this Pizzagate thing you just mentioned, Joseph, to you know what are the feelings that that underlie this i think it's part of our gulf stream image here of the feelings of fear of powerlessness of something nefarious that is secret uh something that is afoot whether it's keeping us from knowledge of these supposed aliens that landed in new mexico uh or the moon landing or something as really heinous as this Pizzagate thing, that we are powerless and that there are other people who know more, who are engineering things uh, behind our back, and the fear that this can inspire in people, if that's even the right word to use, but the powerlessness, disenfranchisement, and then this breaking down into uh, tribes, if you will, of fellow supporters to create a sense of solidarity that seems to be missing from a sense of trust in the larger collective. I think that you said that really beautifully, Deb, that as human beings, we do want a sense of certainty whenever we can grab it. Mm -hmm. If for no other reason to stand against the horrifying existential uncertainties of death and illness and decline and vulnerability and human fragility, And that if we do not have access or capacity to face those enormous vulnerabilities of being human, then we will either manufacture or absorb simplistic, if not damaging, explanations from other seeming authority figures. And that puts us at odds with the reality principle of the world. And as I often say on the podcast, reality is medicinal. So there's something can make us sick when we believe something that violates reality. And we see that a lot in the consulting room, even on subtle levels, people 
attaching false meaning or grasping at things which are not related to the reality of the world that they have lived or are in fact living. Mm -hmm. And when that refusal to embrace reality, a true reality on a mass scale begins to move forward, then we're in that realm of psychic infection and mass hysteria, which can move people to do terrible things or, or at best ridiculous things. I think you're really um, onto something that's so important, Joseph, of the need for certainty. And these are, I think everyone would agree, these are pretty chaotic, uncertain, ju a real jumble of issues and all kinds of things going on. So what we do is we create a story. And big problems, big issues uh, need big stories. A story has been mankind's way of making meaning out of the world since probably the first man created the first tiny little storyline. They do surround us with a sense of meaning and explanation and help us uh, ground into a certain kind of certainty, however at odds it may be with reality. Joseph, I just want to um, lift up what the point you were making with a quote. Jung says, I have frequently seen people become neurotic when they content themselves with the inadequate or wrong answers to the questions of life. Mm. Mm. And one of the things that Jung is leaning to in the consulting room, and I think this is also true in the political world, is that people who feel powerless tend to gravitate towards conspiracy theories or false causalities to also avoid blame for their predicament. And that goes into the idea of neurotic suffering. Yeah. That I'm going to suffer the distress of an illusion mm -hmm. rather than sink down and actually put hands on the true trouble in my life. Mm -hmm. So we are now entering the realm of neurosis from a Jungian point of view. And Jung says, that it is uh, a failed aspect of adaptation, mm -hmm. uh, adapting to uncertainty, to my predicament, adapting to, wow, I feel pretty anxious a lot of the time. And instead, that leads to an inability to hold the opposites. So one side collapses or gets split off into an us versus them. They are doing this and that and the other, and I or we uh, have the right, the truth, and, and the way. And then we have a real imbalance between consciousness and unconscious. And it gets expressed in a way that seems, you know, to other people pretty bizarre. I mean, it's a pretty big stretch to fake the moon landings, for example. So I, I'm just going to posit that that is the result of this kind of inner process uh, where one thing leads to another and then we're out in left field somewhere. You know, Deb, I, I like that you're bringing up failed adaptation. And one of the points that Jung makes that I don't think many other theorists made in quite the same way, at least, is that we have to adapt to the outer world, but we also have to adapt to the inner world. And both of those are the task of the ego, by the way. And I think that part of what's happening with conspiracy theories is a failure to adapt to the demands of the inner world. Something's pressing up from the unconscious. And, and I think that this, this territory that we're in begs the question, how do we relate to the irrational? As, as most con theor conspiracy theories, they, they all have an element of the irrational. And, and how do we relate to that? And I think that, you know, I would posit that we could relate to conspiracy theories much as we might relate to a symptom or a dream, and that we could take them seriously without taking them literally. So we could examine them for their value, for the feeling valence that's in them, for the symbolism, for the archetypal core at the heart of the idea. We could engage with them and be curious about them. Uh, we don't need to dismiss them immediately, 
we can recognize that they carry symbolic value and hold a symbolic attitude. And, and that is so often the, the task as Jungians is to maintain the symbolic attitude and to apply that even to lived circumstances if we think about synchronicity, but certainly to mythologies that are spontaneously emerging in the collective. So whether it's Pizzagate or the fact that uh, some people believe aliens called satanic ritual abuse, satanic ritual abuse, or that the greys, a certain subset of aliens are in fact controlling the banking system. That's another one I'm hearing down here in Virginia beach, that there's something that the collective is trying to reach for that is, is being masked or costumed in some of these extraordinary fantasies that wants to be talked about. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, interested in exploring a little bit about what do we mean by the symbolic attitude. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's take one of these examples and kind of deal with it uh, as we might uh, psychologically. I don't know anything about the grays, but let's just take that as an us versus them. There's a nefarious force out there that's controlling government, banking, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Where I might go with that is, as you're saying, Lisa, to be uh, curious about it because there's a lot of feeling and something is being, in my view, projected onto the outer world that exists in the inner world of that there, where are those forces and feelings in a particular person? And how does it take that particular shape? It could be the grays, it could be the government, it could be a secret society, it could be any one of a number of things, but we choose the grays as a perfect uh, symbol. So Joseph, tell us more about the grays. Yeah, tell us more. Well, in this particular conspiracy theory that the, the world has been invaded by aliens and mm -hmm. uh, for since the beginning of time and that human beings are actually alien genetic hybrids. Okay, what's so weird about that? <laughs> and that people have offered this uh, substantial categorization of aliens, the aliens that are kind of reptilian, the aliens that are gray colored, the aliens that are blue colored, and of course, often the Pleiadians are mm -hmm. these light-filled, uh, evolved aliens that are going to come to rescue humanity. Literally have this situation happen where somebody that I know uh, is deeply involved in this uh, conspiracy theory. And this is probably about a year ago said um, very sincerely, hey, hey, do you think you're going to need any money anytime soon? Because, you know, I'm going to be coming into a huge amount of money. And I said, really? I, I think I'm okay, but what's happening? I'll take some. Yeah, there you are. And so she said, well, you see, the Greys have been controlling the banking system, and I've recently discovered that the Pleiadians are right on the verge of taking over the banking system. They're going to be redistributing all of the international wealth and so I'm going to be really rolling in a big amount of money. And I thought that I would really need to share that with people. Wow. Straight faced, mm -hmm. sincere mm -hmm. from her heart. She really was, you know, wanted, was imagining she'd be in this state of, ex, you know, tremendous generosity and it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, which does go to show that not every conspiracy theory is is dark and uh, about evil and, and nefarious and all that, right? There, there well, are some that both. don't always. Right. It's the theory of the second coming yeah. and the restoration of right order in the realm of light. Yes. And, and then we're in this realm of the religious function of the psyche. Absolutely. Where we need to, we are wired, Jung said, we are hardwired to need to relate to the transcendent and we'll find it wherever we can. So Jung had this idea that he called the religious function of the psyche that we need to relate to something transcendent and that this is just a very basic thing about being human. And I think it does uh, tie into our topic today in conspiracy theories because, you know, one of you said earlier 
that this is really about being swept along into a collective, a conspiracy theory rarely is believed by one person, right? It becomes this collective mythology that a group of people believe. And uh, Jung talked a lot about this, what he, call, what he called mass mindedness, particularly in this very important essay he wrote just at the end of his life called The Undiscovered Self. And I, I want to read just a, a little bit of that right now. He, he was really concerned about people losing themselves in mass mindedness as a result of kind of modern political movements. And he says, um, it's possible to have an attitude to the external conditions of life only when there is a point of reference outside them. Religion gives or claims to give such a standpoint, thereby enabling the individual to exercise his judgment and his power of decision. It builds up a reserve, as it were, against the obvious and inevitable force of circumstances to which everyone is exposed who lives only in the outer world and has no other ground under his feet except the pavement. So when Jung is talking here about religion, he's not necessarily talking about dogmatic religion, but just a sense of being connected with something larger. And obviously we can try to do this through a conspiracy theory such as, you know, the greys or the, what is it, Joseph? The, <laughs> the, the lizard people. The Pleiadians okay. are the good guys, and they're kind of the Bernie Sanders of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think where I'm going, and I realize I'm rambling a bit here, but I think that conspiracy theories may serve as a kind of uh, vehicle through which we can try to have a relationship with the transcendent, but they're a pretty poor substitute for a deeper kind of spirituality. What I'm thinking about is uh, Jonathan Haidt's book uh, that I'll put in the show notes, The Righteous Mind. And he talks, um, he has this thing called the hive hypothesis and that uh, that's our ability as, as highly individualistic people to, under special circumstances, uh, kind of transcend our self-interest and lose ourselves, you know, kind of temporarily or ecstatically or, you know, be part of a greater whole, uh, something that's larger than we are, a phenomenon that you can see in football uh, fans in the stadiums of uh, especially college, I think where they chant and sing songs and, and so on. That, that is a great example of this hive mentality, which might be considered a uh, kind of a lower order in a way of the religious function of being swept along and at least a temporary sense of, of transcendence. So we can see that perhaps believing in conspiracy theories might have this healthy impulse in it. Absolutely. And then I think we can, you know, lift it up one notch if we sort of uh, sacralize it of uh, something, a set of principles or ideas, beliefs that we truly deeply believe in that are we, we believe uh, greater wisdom for the greater good and are perhaps more, more long lasting in that they go from week to week to week and have a kind of superordinate importance in the psyche. That might be the kind of thing uh, the, where the place of conspiracy theories lies. But where I'm going is what Jung talks about over and over again uh, is the individuation process which means separating and differentiating ourselves from set systems of, of belief, belonging, tribalism, even families, that we have to establish our own identity, not an identity based on something else. I wanted to swing back to something uh, both of you had said a moment ago, which is sacralizing a conspiratorial idea. And I think this goes to a, some research that's been done around people who are vulnerable to conspiracy theories is the seduction of feeling special. And when we take an idea, you know, 
whether it's that you have special information about alien races or special information that's coming from somebody in the deep underground of the government and they're sharing secrets with you, that this ability to be the special one in a positive sense because they feel that they're more informed than other people. And that's that's goes to the vulnerability you were mentioning earlier, Deb, of diminished ego functioning. When the ego's not shorn up and muscular, at least to a, an adequate degree, we become vulnerable to all kinds of unconscious dynamics. So being special is one of them. The other thing is a kind of unconscious religious function we were talking about that shows up as superstitious. So people who are vulnerable to conspiracy functions, uh, conspiracy theories rather, often overestimate the likelihood of co-occurring events, and they will attribute nefarious and even supernatural intentionality to things because they have a lower level of analytic thinking. So they'll just assume that this and this are happening on opposite sides of the world because the nefarious underworld of evil people are doing mass coordinations of impossibly intricate complex systems and which creates very simplistic explanations for very, very complicated events. Hmm. Well, I, I was just going to laugh because, I mean, I think that with our idea of synchronicity, uh, people could accuse Jungians of uh, seeing meaning and patterns where perhaps it's just coincidence, right? But it's different with synchronicity in as much as there's an idea of personal process, which is being reflected in the outer world. I think that with conspiracy theory, and we're talking about the more destructive phenomena, mm -hmm. that evil intent is attributed globally mm -hmm. yeah. into this, you know, dangerous cabals. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can understand what you're talking about on a feeling yeah. level, Lisa, but I think it's somewhat different yeah. because synchronicity is often a highly individual process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something else I just want to throw out, which I think is relevant to character structure and Jungian thought, is that in one of the more recent research projects around this, that a vulnerability to conspiracy theory is well correlated with narcissistic features. Really? Yeah. This, this came out of a study in 2016, that the vulnerability that the narcissist has to anything that feels grandiose or paranoid Mm -hmm. um, is incredibly attractive. Joseph, that's really interesting. And it, and it makes sense, you know, because one of the things that's true about paranoia is that it places us, uh, when we're in a paranoid space, we are, we are really the center of the universe, right? It's like these ideas of reference. Everything is happening to us and about us. Yes. In a way that's deeply frightening. And we're looking for causalities, which goes back to the Righteous Mind book that you were saying, Deb, is that we unconsciously begin to feel frightened, but we don't have an adequate view of our own character logic vulnerabilities. So then we scan the environment, or now we scan the internet, and we look for reasons that seem to validate our paranoia. And boy, the florid wild ideas floating around <laughs> seem to be very appealing to certain groups of people. So I'm just uh, picking up on the idea of causation. Searching for causes and just sort of connecting random dots that seem to somehow correlate. That something happens in Australia at the same time that it happens in Canada at the same time that it happened in Argentina that might be a correlation. It is not causation. And that is a, a real um, a skew in a solid and responsible cognitive process. Of that just the, the, the meaning that I make of something inside myself from events in the external world don't necessarily mean that that's really what happened or that's how they were caused. 
I've put that through my own filter, especially uh, with my own feeling functions. If I'm feeling threatened or uh, insecure in some way, uh, it's going to skew the meaning I make of things. I'm just getting a hit, and I and I wish that I had more time to kind of put this together because I could inevitably make it more cogent. But, you know, I, I love this book, The Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist. And I know I've talked about it before on the podcast, but I think that the paranoid mind, that paranoid stance, or, or sort of um, overvaluing certain things, I think what Gilchrist would say, this is really typical of a kind of hypertrophied, um, dysfunctional left hemisphere worldview. Mm. So, you know, it's like mechanistic and fragmented and decontextualized. And, uh, and there's a feeling of paranoia and emptiness. And, and that's, that's how McGilchrist characterizes the kind of mindset that comes about when, when we're too shaped by a left hemisphere versus the right hemisphere that uh, provides context for things. And, and one of the things about a conspiracy theory is like these ideas get latched onto and strung together to create this narrative, but the whole context is absent. So I, I'm wondering about that. What it makes me wonder, Lisa, relative to this informational overload that we have as a culture is that when that left side of the brain is flooded, overwhelmed, and there's this undifferentiated amount of information, conspiracy theories are a defense against an overwhelmed and already exhausted left brain. Mm -hmm. And it gives people a false refuge and a false sense that they are organizing and understanding the modern world, which is incredibly mm -hmm. complicated and overwhelming. And I also want to add a little spank in there, which is it's a sign of a lazy thinking function. Yes. That we just absorb something without adequate questioning. We look at something and all we do is look for affirmation of whatever is making us feel a little calmer in a moment. And that kind of thinking is, is not helpful. It's not helpful to humanity. It's certainly not helpful to individuals. Well, it sounds like we're ending things on a little pessimistic note. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's a time to f switch to a dream and we'll go to the right brain for a while. <laughs> Hi, this is Lisa from This Union Life Podcast. Joseph, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing the podcast involves substantial expenses and we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisunionlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month, and at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. The dreamer is a 25-year-old male who works as a farmhand. And here's the dream. I am with my housemate, L, and we're in a city. The dream begins with us trying to get an answer to a question about the psychology of animals. I do not remember specifics of the question. We've gone to see a psychologist whose last name is Green. He's writing something on his laptop, and when we ask to speak with him, he asks for 30 minutes. There are churros in the waiting area, and for some reason, I'm taking some in a bag. Somehow, I know there's a party that I'm supposed to be bringing these back for. There isn't even a churro machine. A stack of them just continues to appear in the same spot on a desk. Once I've entered the conference room with Dr. Green, I'm in the middle of eating a bite of churro and can't respond to what he is saying, though he is laughing at the fact that my mouth is full of churro. Suddenly, the entire world has changed. 
I'm entering what looks like a room from the back of a club or maybe an abandoned house. The dreamscape room has a deep purple color, and though there is no light in the room, I can still see. At this point in the dream, I become lucid and think, I should make something appear here. However, a man appears in the room, and he begins to wrestle me to the ground. We begin fighting, and the face of the man seems to be changing as we roll. I do not recognize him. I have an intuition that I'm dancing. However, I decide to fight back against the attacker. I punch the man, and the dreamscape changes again. I'm in the middle of a living room at the bottom of a tower and realize that I have just punched Dr. Green. <laughs> I apologize profusely and end up saying, Sorry, Dad. Uh, I mean, Doc. I put my hands on my head after this slip-up, and I'm feeling very confused. Dr. Green says it's okay, and that we should begin making our way up the tower. I look up and see Elle climbing the stairs, and her face is covered in sweat. Dr. Green begins up the stairs, but I realize I can float. I allow myself to float just to see what it's like, and then I wake up. He offers a bit of context. He says, I've been living a somewhat redundant life while in lockdown, and as such, this dream came as a surprise to me. He says that in the dream, he's feeling light and happy when visiting Dr. Green's office. However, it feels darker and more confused and concerned as the dream sequences continue. He offers a bit of explanation and says that he's curious about the relationship between himself and Dr. Green, as well as the sequence that occurs in the tower. I mean, my first quick hit about this dream is that it seems like it is a fairly representative dream about where a young man is in his middle 20s. It seems like this is really a dream about the developmental arc of a young man. You know, he's he's with a feminine figure in the beginning, so he's with maybe sort of an anim anima figure. I, I'm, I wish we knew a little bit more about Dr. Green and about, you know, this person's interest in psychology and why a psychologist. It's the churros in the waiting room are really interesting because it's sort of like the good all giving mother, you know, these, these new churros, these sweet pastries just keep appearing. And, and then there's this uh, encounter with this important masculine figure who happens to be a psychologist. <laughs> so, so something that there's a little bit of a kind of wise old man archetype that's invoked. And his name is Green, uh, which might be associated with something specific in the dreamer's life. But uh, I'm thinking about vegetation and things growing and what is green has, has life. And so he goes to Dr. Green uh, with his um, housemate, L. Everything seems really sunny and nice with these uh, sweet pastries um, endlessly available. And then the world changes. And it changes when Dr. Green laughs at him for having the churros in his mouth. Mm. So there's been a challenge now to leave the world of the mother and to wrestle with the world of the father. Wow, I really like that take on it, Lisa. And I think that's right on. So then what happens is uh, entering what looks like a room from the back of a club or an abandoned house. And this deep purple color, things are darker. He can see. And then a man appears and begins to wrestle him to the ground. So some important... A masculine shadow figure appears, and the wrestling ensues, which reminds me of Jacob wrestling with the angel. It's a real archetypal uh, reference to something unknown, uh, but something very powerful there. And, you know, later there's this great Freudian slip in the dream. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like, okay, if, in case you didn't pick it up, we're talking about the father complex here. <laughs> uh, just letting you know. And, I, you know, I think that in, in, in a man's middle 20s, he does have to wrestle with the father. 
He has to wrestle with who he is in contradistinction to who his father is and who his father wants him to be. There is a wrestling that goes on with the expectations of our parents and uh, we push back and we define ourselves. So it's, it's kind of a great image. Mm -hmm. And I am wondering if this man, um, it really is very conflated with the Dr. Green. He has an intuition he's dancing and then decides to fight back against the attacker. I punch the man and the dreamscape changes again. And he's at the bottom of a tower and realizes he's just punched Dr. Green. So it seems those two images uh, overlap a lot in the father complex. Uh, th there is that sense that the son has to challenge the father. Joseph, you've been very quiet. And I, I have a feeling that you're just going to wow us when you <laughs> finally go at this. So what do you got? I'm just sitting with the transition I'm, I find myself curious about his eating of the churros. It's such a large section and that as soon as they're offered, he just wants more and more and more. And there's this endless supply. And then he, in a sense, kind of starts stealing them, even like packing his pockets up or his, this bag with churros because he's going to start sharing them. I find myself just wanting to sink into that feeling of being insatiable that I think is is also part of this. So where I go to in the beginning is it's it's a righteous start to a quest that he wants to know about the psychology of animals or he wants to know about his own animality. He wants to know about the world of instinct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's a farmhand, you know, so something already has a gravitational pull to this world of instinct and farming, something that's ancient. And I think that's part of this mystery in his psyche. He goes and searches for wisdom. I mean, Dr. Green is a wisdom figure, or could be at least. We don't know whether he turns out to be. Mm. But he's on this quest for wisdom. He's submitted his dream to a Jungian website. I could fantasize that he's looking to Jung or any number of other kind of wisdom sources to try to contain and find language around his own instinctive and arcane part of his psyche. When he just gets in the proximity of wisdom or the possibility of it, he's filled with an overwhelming urge to eat, which is comes from two places. One is with the promise of attaining what he's been searching for, this insatiable hunger to, to be fed by wisdom could in fact be there. Also, I think it's a sign of anxiety. I mm. think when we're just eating sweet, sugary, fried dough, not that I've done that, <laughs> and we can't stop. <laughs> I love churros. <laughs> I know, so right? <laughs> They're so sweet um, that often that's a sign that the ego is nervous and what Dr. Green could tell him might shake him up a good bit, might cause a substantial anxious change in how he sees himself. I think that um, the idea that Dr. Green is kind and laughs and is warm around his anxiety really is interesting. And then there's an enantiodromia that the bright side of the father that's warm and laughing and tolerant immediately constellates this fierce intensity mm -hmm. and wrestling and engagement, which in a sense would follow because Dr. Green is now available for the consult. He's now with the guy yeah. looking at him and he's laughing. So there's a sense like, okay, the engagement's going to begin. And I think what's sobering, and I certainly seen this in some young men, they come asking for wisdom. And then when the wisdom presents itself and it's not what they thought, they find themselves fighting against it because it's going to demand a change and maybe unseat their unearned confidence about mm -hmm. what is true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And until we're ready to yield to a larger context, we want to just rock and socket. But 
it's so wonderful that there's a possibility he could dance with the wisdom teacher, although he'd rather just kind of wrestle. And as you said before, that there's a conflation between the wisdom teacher and the father, that the self and the father complex haven't differentiated out yet. Mm -hmm. So he experiences the larger context of wisdom as a dominating father demand that he's trying to break free of and and loses an opportunity. And at the end of the dream, instead of taking on the vigor of the wisdom teacher, he dissociates. Mm-hmm. Right, right. The anima is willing to sweat it out, but mm-hmm. he's going to float yeah. in the face of the opportunity to have a real engagement with the self. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, my take on the whole churro thing is a little different, uh, which is certainly going to seek the wisdom figure, but uh, hoping to be fed easily and without effort, that these churros just keep churning out and he's going to take them to a party. So this is all going to just be sort of given and be lighthearted, sweet, and fun. Uh, And then it gets a little darker and there is the wrestling. And then with the wrestling, he has the intuition that he's dancing. So again, I see it going back to something more fun, something easier, but then he decides to fight back. And then this conflation with the man, Dr. Green, father, and as they make their way up the tower, he can float rather than do that, as you've said, that tough work of climbing up the stairs and sweating it out. Right. Because if you go up a tower, you will have a greater perspective. You know, the view is much greater and more 360 um, when you're up on top of a tower. There's more objective, more objectivity, um, a kind of sublimatio. But for him, he defaults to floating Mm -hmm. just to see what it's like. Yeah, so this is a first pass at the hero's quest. Mm -hmm. It's not a refusal of the call, but it's ambivalence about the call, which I think is absolutely very, very true to life. Mm -hmm. Of of Should I stay or should I go? Do I really want to do this? How hard is it going to be? Am I going to dance? Am I going to wrestle? I think uh, facing that question, I think that's right, Lisa. It's a first pass. I agree with everything you all are saying. And and the last bit I would say to the streamer, who, by the way, I really like in this dream, uh, it, <laughs> it, it is, he evokes this tremendous likability in me, is to go inside, perhaps, and find a place where you can say yes to learning things about yourself that you won't like. <laughs> that aren't sweet. Yeah. And if you can learn about that, which often is found in the instinctive animal nature, which is not terribly sweet, by the way, you might enjoy the sweaty ascent up the tower and find that the vigor of your young, potent body can actually bring you into the next stage of initiation. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.